so um, I'm Kasturi Kannan. Uh, I'm an associate professor uh, in, uh, in, in uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center in the Department of Translational Molecular Pathology. Uh, before I go into the talk, I would want to know how many of you are biologists here, have a basic idea of biology? Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So uh, this is not going to be a biology talk, okay? So this is a graph uh, kind of conference, so I made this presentation more towards uh, some very rudimentary biology, uh, and if, if, uh, if anything at all. Uh, but then I want to cover some of the aspects, key aspects of what, uh, you know, um, uh, what we are doing. And uh, the second thing is that uh, I don't know if you uh, you might already be tired. I uh, you know uh, I can tell you there are about 25 slides in here. So if you want to look at the numbers, this is not available right now. Um, and, but, and then I want this to be a, a, a you know not to be a monologue, but I want to be a dis have it as a discussion. So feel free to interrupt me anytime uh, you know um, uh, during the presentation. All right, let's get it started. Uh, before going into the talk, I would want to uh, establish the credibility on uh, you know um, some of these things. So uh, basically, uh, the stuff that I have highlighted are some key milestones that uh, that have happened in my life um, as education. I earned my PhD in computer science, um, and then uh, I secured an internship position that uh, gave me an exposure to working in an industry. And then I shifted back a uh, career uh, into academia, where I was an assistant professor at uh, New York University and now uh, a faculty in, um, uh, in MD Anderson. As far as uh, my directed efforts are concerned, uh, you know, have had several successful collaborations and high impact publications. So altogether, I would put myself into the category of being a data scientist uh, for 15 years, uh, aimed particularly in cancer research. Okay. All right, that's about me. Now let's go to the talk. Um, uh, you know, if you look about the state of the modern biomedicine, right, uh, it's, it goes to this uh, known story about uh, elephant and blind men, right? I mean, like people uh, 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 you know, uh, touch the elephant's ears and say it's a fan. Some people touch the tail and say it's a, it's a snake, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we are partially capturing the data and, uh, you know, as the adage goes, right, uh, the, the rhyme of ancient mariner, water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink. And now it has become data, data everywhere, not a drug, I think, right? I mean, it's, it has become so complicated that uh, uh, we don't have any clue. The papers are piling up a uh, dime a dozen, you know, every minute. So it's a breakthrough in cancer. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we found a cure for cancer and stuff like that. But the problem is that uh, we have been uh, trying to do cancer research, or in general, the modern biomedicine has been very fragmented. And uh, we have to go into detail of what it means, right, in the context of uh, medicine, what it means by this tail and what it means by this trunk. And uh, so I'm going to go over some basic, very, very basic uh, genetics. Uh, we all know we carry cells, and uh, each of our cells have DNA. And uh, the DNA produces what is known as a messenger RNA. And then the messenger RNA produces proteins. And this uh, has uh, separate names. Uh, the, uh, the thing that converts from DNA to messenger RNA is called transcription, as well as uh, from what happens with the mRNA to protein is called translation. This is the central dogma of molecular biology. And uh, one of the key things uh, that uh, we are concerned is, uh, in general, what is known as uh, the gene expression, the way that genes are uh, being expressed in our bodies. And that's given by the messenger RNA. So that's a very critical uh, aspect of, um, uh, of, of several of these uh, data that we usually get. So uh, one of the key things is that now, uh, uh, when we think about DNA, it's common across all of uh, our, uh, our, our body, right? If you take a saliva to uh, hair to you know, any tissue that we take, all contains the same DNA. So, uh, but then uh, the mRNA is different, right? I mean, how does, uh, how does then um, the, the gene A give rise to a different protein, as, uh, whereas the gene B gives rise to yet another completely different protein, right? It makes a heart cell, uh, uh, the different from neurons and kidney cells, et cetera, et cetera. This is the work done by mRNA, right? The, the DNA is just responsible for the basic uh, architecture, but the different mRNA produces uh, different proteins, and that gives rise to different tissues that we have, right? So, so now, the question of uh, how different mRNAs are produced by the same DNA, right? We know um, that certain areas of this DNA, we call it as gene, and uh, they have this uh, uh, a triplet of these genes, right? Uh, it's called codons. 
And these codons are responsible for producing different amino acids, right? Uh, in the messenger RNA, the transcription, uh, it's called the transcription when we have these three letters that changes to A, G, A, right? For instance, TCT gives rise to A, G, A, and these codon gives rise to different proteins. The amino acids forms the protein, right? So this is the basic uh, architecture for how different uh, uh, messenger RNAs are produced by the same DNA, right? So if we shift the letter A, uh, uh, this, uh, th this letter uh, to uh, ACT, then the pro the code that that that's now uh, that's now transcript uh, uh, that's now obtained through transcription, the ACT now becomes UGA and gives that gives rise to a completely different protein, right? So this is this is how the basic uh, mRNAs are produced by the same machinery, just by a change in a one letter that you can like completely have a different protein, and these are called point mutations. Uh, in general, so in cancer, usually uh, you know we, we study these things like what exactly uh, the letter changes that have happened, and uh, these are point mutations, and these point mutations can produce a completely different gene expression, right? And this is the mainstream narrative, like uh, all we have, right? I mean, uh, in general, the mainstream narrative is about genetics, right? Of course, it's all not fake news in entirety, but uh, <laughs> but this is uh, the much more the major narrative of uh, molecular biology is the genetics that that has occupied the mainstream of biology for nearly maybe 40, 40 years or something like that. Uh, but but there is a uh, yet another mechanism that happens that has been uh, that has been extremely uh, uh, you know uh, that has come into a, a, a scientific inquiry for maybe around uh, 10, 15 years that's been studied heavily. So we know this uh, DNA are packaged into what are known as chromosomes, and uh, this uh, you know the entire architecture is a chromatin. I mean, the chromatin contains these nucleosomes. Now uh, we have this strand genes, right? Um, and uh, there are some uh, phenomenon that can happen to certain positions of the gene, like promoter regions of the gene. Uh, that is, uh, there could be several things like histone modifications and methylation. Methylation is one of the uh, uh, key mechanisms. Like for instance, a methyl group can get tagged near the genes, and so the genes will not be expressed at all. So uh, this is a classic mechanism that is, that is comparable uh, to uh, what happens on the genetics level. And this is uh, termed epigenetics. And you may have heard this word often thrown, thrown around everywhere, right? Uh, epigenetics is now uh, uh, almost everywhere when you think about uh, how the cancer cells are behaving and things like that. So like you can think of DNA methylation as an on-off switch, right? I mean, so I know the, the, uh, the, the you know, uh, if, 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 if this promoter region, this particular base is not methylated, then the genes are expressed. And if there is a group, methylation group, the genes uh, will not be expressed. And so you have an on-off switch that controls similar to the on-off switch that happens by the base change on the DNA level, right? So uh, we have these, right? Uh, let's say, for instance, the, C, the base C is turned into A, and we have these genetics that can change, uh, the, uh, produce a different expression. On the other hand, there could be a methyl group that can uh, give rise to a completely uh, different gene expression as well, right? So when we are born, there is an epigenetic reprogramming that happens that wipes out all the uh, slate, uh, you know, uh, and then creates a new, that's why like a son of a smoker is not a smoker or, you know, um, and daughter of a neo 4 j expert need not be a neo 4 j expert, right? So, so uh, the, the, the nature has made sure that you know when we are born, we are born with a clean slate, and that that largely happens to epigenetics. Uh, whereas the genetics, uh, it's there, it's given by our parents, and so uh, you know there's no way to change the structure of uh, the the genes uh, in general. I mean, right? So uh, the question now is. What what rules the underlying uh, you know gene expression change? Uh, who claims that it is going to be genetics? Who thinks it's genetics that's ruling? No. How about epigenetics? Who thinks it's epigenetics? At the end of the day, both control the gene expression. Who thinks it's it's, it's purely driven by epigenetics? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I'll come to that. Uh, who says neither? Right? Or Combination. Who says it's combination? Okay. Uh, why? Well, because, well, it's two mechanisms that can change the same outcome, right? But how do we even rule out 
genetics or uh, epigenetics in the first place. I mean, yeah, of course, you know, but, but my question is like which predominantly, uh, you know, uh, which predominantly do we have a, uh, uh, can we rule out any of these in entirety, right? I mean, although the epigenetics is new, but underlying genetics is uh, much more, uh, you know, uh, mainstream, we clearly know the functions of genes and stuff like that, right? So our experience says, in general, it could be both, right? Right, I mean, but, but what is experience? What is experience? Experience is some information that either strengthens our belief or weakens our belief, right? And information is data, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it is the data. So, I mean, the thing is that, right? I mean, when, when we want to rule out something, if we want to say both, it's both genetics and epigenetics, we may have to rule out some of them, right? So, I mean, at the end of the day, it is, it is the data, right? In all, God, we trust all of us must be data, as, uh, known as it shows, right? So it's, it's the absence of consensus. The key thing is that we need to have uh, to rule out whether it is genetics or epigenetics, and there is an algorithm to do it, right? So we have the sequence, the uh, 3.2 billion letters of our DNA. So the key, al the algorithm to go about in ruling whether it's genetics or epigenetics is find all the 3.2 billion letters as a sequence, right? And um, or extract at least the portions that code for these proteins, right? These are the genome uh, uh, specific areas of the genome. There are about 20,000 genes in the human genome and look for gene sequence changes, right? And then you have to look for methylated regions, the promoters, and then correlate with the expression to say that which rules it, right? So if we have, we don't know what it is, right? At the end of the day, it could be genetics that could be ruling, but we have to find out the truth, and data is the only source that we could, we could identify how uh, genetics or epigenetics uh, rules in there, and there is a clear algorithm to do it. And fortunately, uh, uh, you know, the, comes to the question of next generation sequencing. Fortunately, we can do that in this uh, technology era, right? About uh, in the year 2000, we have this whole genome sequence by, through the Human Genome Project. And so it, uh, that, that technology has matured to an extent that uh, just last week I saw that there was a genome that can be sequenced for 100 uh, bucks. It was around 1,000 bucks. Now it has come to 100 bucks. So, so uh, initially, it's about uh, when the uh, Human Genome Project was there in 2000, it was $3 million to sequence a human genome, and now it's 100 bucks. I mean, uh, so, so it made the identifying of these sequences of the nucleotides possible, right? So we have the genomic DNA. The technology is that it can break the DNA, and you can uh, put it in a flow cell. The flow cell forms clusters, and then you can identify the sequence in there, right? It can, we can do identify both the DNA, RNA, as well as the methylated sequences. And it's very affordable nowadays. You can, uh, you can sequence the entire uh, genome uh, in about eight to 11 days uh, and with like less than $1,000. And uh, like I said, it's, it's becoming $100 now. And there is a reference genome is available. So all of the stuff is available to make sure that whether we can rule out genetics or epigenetics or it's a combination of both. I mean, the, or it could be neither. There could be new mechanisms, right? We don't know. But, but the key thing is that we now have the technology to test. And, uh, and that has... Um, become a data deluge in biology. I mean, it's an explosion of data sets. I mean, once we have figured out uh, how exactly the sequences are, right? I mean, it's not just like some portions of it. Now we can exactly uh, 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 figure out the sequence. And through that, we can like identify mutations. It's just a machine. You just put in a DNA. Of course, all the preliminary uh, you know, uh, lab work, if it's, uh, once it's done, you can extract the DNA or RNA. You can put it in there. And we are, it's going to spit out all the uh, mutations in there. And then it's going to spit out the copy numbers. Copy numbers is the number of copies of these genes. Usually in cancer, there are multiple copies of these genes. And then we can, of course, find the gene expression. We can sequence the uh, mRNA. And then you can find the gene expression as well as you can find the methylation. There are so many things that could uh, that we could do in uh, uh, that we could do using uh, this next generation sequencing technology. And these are the I mean, uh, there are too many things that we could do with that uh, structural variants. Uh, you know, uh, so many other things that could. But but these are in general uh, the most common things that people study. Uh, yet now we can like. We have an option to choose, uh, you know, we have an option to figure out whether it is genetics or epigenetics. And uh, this was the main uh, function of uh, the, the, the Cancer Genome Atlas project. They had sequenced a lot to figure out whether it's genetics or epigenetics. Lots of studies have come out of this, and yet there was no consensus because 
I mean, at the end of the day, right, if you want to, let's say, uh, 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 you know, study aerodynamics, we can't be studying the wings separately and uh, the engine separately, right? Aer aerodynamics is a function of uh, of all of the components working together harmoniously, right? I mean, that's, so again, it comes, we know that uh, our experience have told that it's both, but now we have the power of uh, uh, te uh, technology and data to rule out that it's neither genetics or epigenetics. Now we can study both, but how do we study both without ripping the plane apart, right? I mean, if you want to study the aerodynamics or if you want to study the human genome functions, we have to put together all of these data sets. I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 that's the problem with the current uh, biology, like I started with uh, the, the elephant and blind man, right? I mean, modern biology is more or less reductionistic. We are like trying to think, okay, dividing each of these and trying to understand a gene or a you know, group of genes, and we can try to put together, that's not going to work because once you break the system, you're, it's going to, I mean, we can try to understand it, but once you're breaking the system, putting it together to ha have a holistic understanding, it's almost impossible. It's like, uh, you know, in, in quantum mechanics, you have this Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? You can't determine the position and the, or any conjugated variables together, right? Um, uh, at the same time, simultaneously, right? That's a key word there. Uh, the similar thing that happens in here, like, I mean, once you try to understand something by dividing, putting it together and studying doesn't work, right? Uh, uh, this is because uh, biomedicine, especially cancer, is very complex and adaptive. These are emergent phenomena, like, I mean, the, the cells organize themselves, uh, you know, uh, in a very, very complicated way, as well as uh, it's adaptive, right? It's, it's a microenvironment. We have to understand the tumor microenvironment and stuff like that. You can think, uh, so this is a philosophical change uh, when we think about th studying things together versus studying things uh, separately, right? Uh, this is like reductionism, right? Reductionism is like a relational database, right? You, you break into tables, it's easy, it's very naive, uh, and then make some joins and try to put it together, and we are trying to study it, right? I mean, that's, that's a classical reductionism, but a systems philosophy is different. You, 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 we start with a holistic principle right in the beginning. And that is where I think, uh, you know, when, when today I was resonating to some of these talks about Neo4j, uh, I mean, we should, we should completely think of it as a new philosophical uh, way of looking at things rather than uh, making the relational system better. Uh, I don't think uh, graph technology is trying to make the relational systems better. It's, it's, it's a completely philosophical outlook of doing stuffs together. So we need an integrative paradigm. The key paradigm is that the whole is not the sum of the parts. That is what it defines a system's biology or system's thinking, right? The whole cannot be ever uh, some of it, some of the parts of it, right? So uh, with this, uh, and people have already thought about it. And systems biology, when we look at the definitions of systems biology, right? Uh, this is a classic uh, uh, in, from the Institute of Systems Biology. This is a classic diagram. There is this technology that leads to computation and that leads to new biology, new insights, new biological questions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the key word they are missing, as I saw, is that an integrative technology has to be an integrative technology, and that integrative aspect of systems biology has been missing. And uh, the, the, the thing is that um, the, the integrative aspect, it's, it's, it's a defining aspect of it, in fact, uh, when we talk about systems biology. And uh, now, uh, so the key thing is that the, with this framework in mind, okay, I hope that sets the premise for what we wanted to do, right? Um, yeah. All the basic philosophical uh, issues on uh, doing stuffs. Now, with this uh, background, right, um, uh, we started working on Systems Biology Initiative for Brain Tumors at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So the goal of this project was to create a unifying framework to integrate all available patient data um, and tumor recurrence data, right, people who have been given chemotherapy and radiation um, uh, and in an unbiased manner, right, for, for target validation to predict the disease outcomes uh, for initiating clinical trials. That was the goal of the project, like, we started, uh, then how do we integrate all of them, right? So that's, uh, and also what kind of a brain tumor that we are talking about. So if you think about uh, glioblastoma, uh, if you think about brain tumors, there are lots of brain tumors, and especially glioblastoma is one of the, uh, is one of the most lethal of the brain tumors. It has a median survival of about, uh, uh, about, uh, about a year. People almost die within a year. Uh, especially the clinical history, uh, you know, for uh, uh, less than three months of the, I mean, the, the prognosis was for older patients. It's, it's one of the most severe uh, 
uh, you know, tumors that you can find, like it, it, it's, it's lethal. And people have no idea of how to go about in, um, in more than 40, 50 years, there's not been much done in the field of uh, brain tumors. And, and my expertise have been in studying brain tumors for about 10 years. I've uh, been closely working with a neuropathologist and neuro oncologist, so uh, so so that that made a, a natural um, you know uh, progression for studying uh, brain tumors through this integrative uh, uh, structure. So obviously, graph architecture, right? Uh, what else could come as an integrative framework than studying the graph architecture? So the the key thing is that about graphs is that uh, integration and unbiased analysis become very natural. Right, I mean, integration is handled by defining relationships. As soon as you define a relationship, there is an integration. And of course, unbiased analysis handled by uh, writing appropriate queries. So, so a graph is a natural structure for systems biology. And in fact, I would say that it's a defining aspect of systems thinking uh, that people often uh, miss, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's a defining aspect. It's not just one aspect of it. If, I mean, I, I don't think you can separate systems and complex adaptive systems uh, separately and graphs separately. They, they, are, they go hand in hand and emergent phenomena and all these things. So um, now the question is whether this idea is new. Uh, obviously not. Um, people have uh, done this before. So uh, in one of these publications that came in uh, 2017 um, that says that a graph database that 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 connects genetic and epigenetic events in colorectal cancer. So what in this paper they did was they they took these uh, events like mutation and hypermethylation events and they have connected them through uh, the type of uh, disease uh, cancer that they get. So in colorectal cancer people can get adenoma or they could have a healthy tissue or they could have a metastasis or they could have a polyps or carcinoma. Okay. So they are connecting uh, different types of uh, these um, data, uh, patient data, saying that uh, you know, like patients who have hypermethylated in a particular gene uh, are, are connected to mutations if they have uh, if they have carcinoma, right, or polyps, or um, or uh, or any of these categories, right. So uh, this is this is problematic. I found that this this is a problematic thing. Once I uh, read this paper, the problem is that. This, this is restricted to property of patients, right? So it is, it is a property of patients. So let's say that a new patient comes in and they don't have any of these five categories, right? They have a colorectal cancer. Let's say that they are di diagnosing a new category in there. Where will you put this patient in here? Is there a framework for putting this patient in here? So, so the, the, the problem with such a framework is that there is a necessity to create additional relationship types in such a framework, right? So, I mean, so this also results in restricted survival analysis. I will go over that later. But, but, uh, but the thing is that when we are uh, dealing with constructing graphs, we have to make sure the relationships that we define is uh, comprehensive. It can include additional data that we could uh, uh, ingest in the, data, uh, in the database and so many other things that goes in there, right? So, so what is, so, so there are three things that our, our database should contain. One is that they have to be integrative, right? And the second is that um, the relationship that you define should not be subjective. Like for instance here, uh, it is subjective because a pathologist would define something as polyps and pathologists are subjective. Where they don't have, uh, the, the digital pathology has not come yet and people, you know, when they classify patients in one of these groups, it's very subjective, right? So this is a subjective data set, right? So we should move from subjectivity to objectivity for having an unbiased system. And the third is time dependence, right? So um, I'll tell you this. Let's say that we are constructing a graph and uh, a simple graph, say Anne is married to Ryan, right? Now uh, in, this, in this relationship model, right? Let's say that tomorrow they are, they are getting a divorce, right? What happens to this system? It's no longer valid, it's no longer true, right? So instead we say Anne knows Ryan and special type of property is, is married to a type of property, then it's eternal. They are going to know each other even they get a divorce, right? So, so the system should have these th key critical things. One, it has to be integrative. The second is that uh, it should not be subjective, it should be objective. And the third is that it should not be time dependent. It should not be based on, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, it should be universal across time, right? So what kind of a relationship we could come uh, think of satisfying these three properties? 
Anybody? You're trying to integrate data sets. What kind of a relationship that you would put in so that so that it is not time dependent, so it stands eternal? Yeah. From my experience, you have to model that as event. Absolutely, yeah. Everything is an event. So all the data sets are event. But how do you connect to events? Should it be time-dependent property? Yeah. Why is that? Uh, the, the thing is that if you have a time-dependent property, it can change over time, and that system will not be valid after that period of time, right? Mm -hmm. Even be the scientific consensus that we have, let's say in 10 years, the, sci the science uh, is like completely going in a different direction, and the system is not going to be valid anymore. Uh, I just don't want to distract the talk, but I, sure. I, I, that's actually a question I've been thinking a lot. Right, so okay. Right. Information and how do you process the information? Right. Information. Right. Often, you just point out a huge challenge right there. Yeah, so okay. I'll tell you the answer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we do this. Uh, it's as simple as this. We model everything as an event. And say that two events are connected if a bunch of patients undergo those events. So the relationship or the patients, there is no difference between a relationship and a patient. If a bunch of patients undergo certain events, they form an edge. Okay? So this system is going to be integrative because you are capturing everything as a molecular event, be it mutation, be it gene expression, whatever, no matter what. It is not subjective because it is the patient's. It is not patient's property. It is not patient having something. And it is eternal. As long as there are patients, the system is going to be true because your connection is patient's. So there is no difference between an edge and a patient. Okay, so that's, that's the framework we are putting together here. And um, uh, uh, we call it as genome for graph engine for systems medicine. And uh, this is an example uh, graph database uh, that we have developed here. We have methylation events, we have mutation events, we have expression events, copy number events. And two events are connected if they are shared by more than one patient. Uh, it could be one patient too, but the more patients you add, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The patients are individual nodes, and the similarity between them forms an edge. The similarity could be calculated by cosine similarity on the node, right? the attributes of which could be copy number variation, methylation, and something else. Yeah, so it's a, it's a dual graph, right? Uh, you are basically uh, uh, turning the edges into the, uh, yeah. the the. I mean, from from a graph structure, it's it's it it, it doesn't matter, but. There are some key things that are going to matter because in, uh, at least in graph Neo4j, you can have multiple labels for nodes and have only one label for uh, edges. And there are some logistical issues with that framework. I'll, I'll come to that later. We can discuss about that. Uh, but, but the problem, so, so this is the framework that we are building. So we are, we are connecting, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, we could theoretically do that. It doesn't matter, but we can also put it as a property in one edge. It, uh, you, you can actually create multiple edges. That's fine. I mean, uh, from from a from a, uh, a perspective of the graph, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, you can create 10,000 patients who undergo those events. But for us, we just put it as one, and then we put all the patients' information in there. So yeah. Do you have a threshold of the number of patients, or like more than this number of patients that it means? <laughs> Right, right now the threshold is one. We have more than one. So two or more patients should have it, but it could be as even we can have it was one, it doesn't matter. But the more, uh, you know, the more patients they go under a certain trajectory, it's, be it's best. I, I, will, I will discuss that in a, in a bit. So right now uh, our, our database contains about 370 patients, uh, which has about uh, 11,000 nodes and 16 million relationships. And this is the Venn diagram of mutation, copy number, gene expression, and methylation uh, uh, events in there. Uh, there is about 58% of them, uh, 50, uh, 58 patients, or 13% of them have, have all the data. But uh, the good thing about this is that it, you, know, you can integrate any uh, data that is available, and it's not necessary that all of them should have all the data in here, right? All right, so the key thing is that garbage in, garbage out. How do you select? I mean, if you look at the number of events that we have, we have only about 11,000 nodes and 16 million relationships. 
So the thing is that uh, the, the, you know we, we, the number of nodes are very less compared uh, to relationships. The key thing is that we cannot be putting in whatever data that we get. Like a single human genome is about 200 GB data just for one patient, right? Uh, think about 370 patients. I mean, you know, it's it's all uh, you know searching for needle in a haystack. The more uh, data that you put. Uh, the more crazier it's going to be. So the curation of the data and what you ingest into it, uh, it's, it's very, very important. So for instance, one of the uh, identifying uh, mutations, the key mutations that give rise to functional uh, phenotypes, right? So the, we, are, we, are, um, we are having those mutations in there. Those are called driver mutations. There is, a, there is a reasoning behind it. It's an evolutionary construct. Those mutations that give fitness advantage uh, to the propagation of cells, those are uh, take those, those take priority than those mutations that just sit without doing anything. Right when the cells duplicate, all those that really con don't contribute to the fitness of the cell are going to just be propagated. Right, the cell is dividing. It's not just that a mutation alone. Right. So uh, there are some analysis that could be done to identify the key mutations. This is just for mutations, but the same done, is done for copy numbers. This, the same kind of an, uh, thing is done for gene expression and methylation. So when we curate the data, we made sure that all of them are functional, which are like, you know, a correlation is not causation. So ultimately, this has to be tested in mouse. This has to be tested in, um, you know, uh, uh, wet lab experiments, cell lines, and stuff like that. So um, and then, uh, obviously, patients greater than one, right? Uh, that's a threshold. The more number of patients you have for the system, it's going to be better. And we have a robust statistics, Fisher's exact test, and connected events. Uh, and then the, the, the key thing about is the random walks and survival correlation, and that's uh, going to be the next one. So I'm going to talk about it. So one of the cool things about this uh, framework is that uh, the ages are patients, right? They are no distinct than patients. So for each of those trajectories, we will have the survival of the patients. Okay, so here A is a trajectory a patient takes, B is another trajectory a bunch of patient takes, and C is another bunch of trajectory. So these patients are going to have survival, difference in survivals, right? And uh, so you can have a Kaplan-Meier uh, to identify if how the survival, how, what are the key things, nodes in here that contribute to a difference in survival? Well, we can enumerate all of them, right? That's an easy thing to do. But if you are enumerating all of them, it's an NP-complete problem. It's never going to end, right? So, so basically what we do is a random walk. Fortunately, uh, in Neo4j, there is a random walk that's implemented. So at every node, we toss a coin um, or you know roll a die to say which path it takes, right? So that's a random walk, uh, a basic algorithm. And uh, even with four uh, hedges and four nodes, you have about 13 possibilities. So uh, that's why we do the random walk, like I said. And um, we have done lots of simulations. And this is one of the simulations we have um, in random walk. So it consisted of about 156 walks for these patients. And we look at the path number 51 compared to patients who don't take that path. And you see that there are some patients who have the survival differences. And these are the key genes that are, uh, that are, uh, that are involved in this uh, survival differences. And it's not just mutation alone. Um, it's also copy number variation, like 14 to 32 Q and et cetera. Since it's an integrative database, you can you will be able to correlate survival, putting it everything together. So current uh, paradigm in biology is like just looking at mutations, just looking at gene expression. But here we get all the biomarkers in one go by doing this uh, survival analysis. So these are the key genes that we have identified for path 51. And similarly, the path 54, that also turned out to be very significant. Like patients who have these things, they survive lesser since it's a recurrence data. The red is a patients who are surviving lesser than ones that are in blue. And uh, similarly, this is another random walk simulation. Uh, we have these, uh, uh, you know, these two paths. So these are the, uh, the black is a copy number, uh, the the LO is a mutation, so we we see that there is there is a survival difference between these uh, two different paths that patients take, right? So we now have a framework where we not only can say with DNA, but on the RNA level, on the protein level, and you can even throw in images in here. I mean, right? I mean, uh, to identify. So it's it's a very inclusive and integrative database, and this is another one that's done for one of the lethal um, uh, brain. I think this is for uh, IDH wild type, which is the most uh, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 most lethal brain cancer on glioblastoma. On path 16, we do have a key su survival differences, like these genes, NU, MR2, GABA receptor, uh, KCNK, the uh, potassium channel, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, uh, and, we and we saw that there are lots of literature pointing out to these things, and uh, there's a bunch of things that, have, uh, that we have identified, like the glutamatic uh, you know, synaptic input, 
uh, and so many things that are coming out now, like because people have been looking at an isolation, we now are synthesizing it. We are seeing like literature everywhere uh, for the for the biomarkers that we find. So these are some of the uh, key publications that has been published on um, on on um, on the on the targets biomarkers that we have identified, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, and of course the novelty of this approach, right? I mean, it provides a strong framework for systems biology paradigm in medicine. It's patient driven, then patient properties driven, right? It's it's a you know the properties. Uh, it's not based on patient properties, but rather on patients themselves. It's truly unbiased and integrative. It's not time dependent. Uh, so it's not based on scientific consensus or not even subjective, uh, whatever be it, right? And uh, and a correlation with survival combining multiple biomarkers has not been attempted so far. So uh, people have not uh, yet identified uh, correlating with sur uh, you know survival, and uh, that's the key thing. We can identify biomarkers if you are having imaging data. We can throw it in there and identify some cool uh, imaging features that can be prognostics of uh, survival. Right? I mean, so those are the key things that could uh, uh, that we could do. So. Um, so yeah, I mean, with that, um, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time. Maybe I, I think I should, com I felt I should compensate for the uh, time loss. Um, so yeah, with uh, we would like to thank the patients and their families for entrusting the data with us, and of course, Neo4j and Neo4j team, uh, Rob, Fani, and of course, Greg has been instrumental in getting this program going as a proof of concept at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, my student uh, Yang is here. Um, he has been developing the database. Uh, he's a terrific student. He's shown keen enthusiasm, um, you know, and he understands the systems biology, and uh, he's, he knows, uh, you know, this is the future. And one of my collaborators, Jason Hughes, uh, we have been working, he's a stellar neuropathologist, and we have a wonderful rapport uh, of more than 10 years of collaboration. Um, and also my neuro-oncology chair, Dr. Puduvalli, and uh, 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 Fred Lang is a neurosurgeon. Um, you know, he holds the Biden BU chair, and uh, he has been very, very supportive. They know that this is a way to go, and MD Anderson recognizes it, uh, especially because of Dr. David Jaffrey. He's a senior vice president and CTO. Uh, we have had lots of discussions, uh, and also he has provided the database availability in the institution, and he's a huge systems thinker. He's a physicist radiation uh, a physicist, and he strongly subscribes, uh, knows that this is the way to go. But then we are trying to build a huge consensus on the entire medical field, I mean, or biomedical field, which has been a very challenging task for us because, uh, you know, biologists have not been trained to think on a systems level. They have been trained to think only on a reductionist level, trying to understand genes and biochemistry behind it and not synthesizing the data and trying to put it together to understand the whole picture. So we have not it there. Uh, that's been one of our biggest challenges. Um, and of course, the Moonshot program at MD Anderson, there are huge coordinators and administrative support and obviously made this funding and logistics to make this project possible. Um, and Brain Tumor Center, I'm part of Brain Tumor Center, and the entire data is from the GLASS consortium. It's a glioma longitudinal analysis GLASS consorti uh, uh, consortium that has profiled this data. We have a unique data of patients uh, pre-surgery uh, pre, uh, and post-surgery uh, data, which is not available anywhere. Uh, this is uh, one of the key data that would help us understanding the, chemo, the effects of chemotherapy and radiation on patients. Uh, you know, all the previous efforts on the cancer space has been done only on the primary tumor and not on the recurrent tumor. And we are all, this is data is about recurrent tumor, so several of them are unpublished data. Uh, and I would like to th uh, thank our um, uh, support, database support, uh, Rue and Suran, who did uh, lots of uh, database support work, working with Rob, uh, IT support and stuff. And uh, finally, uh, my wife, Lavanya, she's a, she's a graph theorist, and she evangelized me completely, you know, getting into graphs. Um, yeah, she, uh, you know, she has been, like, uh, uh, telling, yeah, this is, you know, she gets so excited about graphs and all the time. You know, uh, I used to joke, you know, we, we talk about Neo4j more than we call our kids' names in our home. <laughs> and the kids are like, who's this Neo4j? I mean, like, you know, the, you, you should, uh, yeah. And he says, I'm a, I'm a mom is very crazy about Neo4j, and she complains to me <laughs> anyway. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, with this, uh, I would like to conclude my talk, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I think we have ample time, or at least uh, my time, we have some more time for uh, answers, question and answers. Yeah, thank you.